Hey fellow Freaksters, it's Tim from the Moratorium. Just here to remind you that if you enjoy what you hear, please like, share, and subscribe, then rinse and repeat. We're just a couple of small town nerds trying to make sweet geek love to your ear holes, and we could use your support. Check out our website for movie reviews, links to social media, merch, movies, and more. You can find us at themoratorium.com. Now that that's out of the way, on with the shenanigans. Hey, guys and girls. I can only hope that there are some chicks out there listening to this. So check it out. Jason and I are finally back in the moratorium to bring you the best of our worst. If you don't know, this is the Yarn Wall. This is where we break down what's left of the previous movie, and then we do some deep dives into some careers of a few character actors. Also, we have the Goratorium, and finally we make a thread to the next movie. We want to thank Nate in advance for this awesome new opening. So let's get on with it. All right, first things first. I got to get something out of the way. Okay. Okay. I did not know that there was a Karate Kid cartoon. <laughs> I don't know if I knew that there was a Karate Kid cartoon. Let's see how many tabs on IMDb I can open up. Yeah. I can't find it on IMDb. Okay. Uh, but YouTube? I found it on YouTube, and I have no idea what I was looking for. When I came across it, and there's a cool little video that has the theme song and uh-huh. Mr. Miyagi swinging from a vine, and he oh, no. he wrestles an alligator. What? <laughs> it's the same plot as the movie, but they're in Louisiana now for some reason. <laughs> it is. It is so strange looking. Weird. What era are we talking? Is it like uh, the real Ghostbusters, mm. or that's probably it. Are there any of the characters from uh, Frozen or Spider-Man or anything? Are they in there, too? <laughs> no. Because I think that's something different. I can't find anything for it. No, it's uh, the Karate Kid animated series. One season. I think there was 10 episodes. That's what I found or something like that. I could be totally wrong. But did you know that there was a uh, Karate Kid regular Nintendo game? Mm. Why do we call it regular Nintendo? <laughs> <laughs> you mean it's the actually NES? just Nintendo. We call it the NES. I've always just called it regular Nintendo. <laughs> um, some of those games, you know, uh, they all just kind of look the same, like the Goonies or, you know. Mm-hmm. And this kind of looks like a side scroller, kind of like a, a mix between Kung Fu and Karate Champ, because there's like <laughs> yeah. a... There, it looks like there's a cut scene that you can do uh, to catch a fly. You oh, know, cool. with a, oh, of course. Yeah, you got to do that. And break through the ice. Wait a minute. Yeah, now I remember. Now I remember that. I mean, if there is like a little Shinobi style, like mm-hmm. throwing the stars, but it's just chopsticks and flies. Yeah. Yeah, I vaguely remember that. Yeah, it looks like fun. I want to play it. Oh, man. I got to look it up now. <laughs> now. Now you've got me on a whole... I'm going to have to have another computer just to just for IMDb. Mm-hmm. I don't remember what the heck you and I were talking about, but man, I wish I could remember what even brought it up. But there was a oh, it was we were talking about the beast um, with mm-hmm. Jason Patrick, you know, and uh, so I put the B, you know, I searched for the beast in IMDb and a few results down. There is a like cop drama with Patrick Swayze called The Beast. Have you seen that? Uh no. It must have been uh, okay. So it was really, you know, Patrick Swayze looks older. I mean, I don't want to like start off like this, but it had to be not <laughs> too long after that 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 he was uh, you know, that he like started showing signs of the cancer, you know. 
Um, cause okay. he was still fit, but I could tell that he was a little older and a little beefier, you know? But yeah, there's like one season of a cop drama called The Beast with Patrick Swayze and, hmm. um, oh, you just should look at the cast. It's insane. Yeah. A veteran FBI agent is assigned to a new partner, unaware that he was recruited as a double agent to investigate his activities. The w- Beast. When you do A&E. the movie guy voice, yeah, that's my favorite part of the podcast. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh. You have a favorite part. <laughs> I mean. Uh, there's a. Oh, he must be a rapper by the name of Sticky Fingers. Yes. I think that that is. I think they were just following like the, um, you know, kind of special victims unit uh, template. They got to have a rapper in there. Gotcha. Kevin J. O'Connor. Pamela Reed. Did you say Sinead O'Connor? Uh, no, I didn't say Sinead O'Connor. I said Pamela Reed and uh, Kevin J. O'Connor. Right, yeah. Yeah. That's the guy that, that was the first guy that we talked about. Was that was that our first uh, deep dive? I think so, yeah. Now oh, they all run together. I know. I need to keep better notes because I'm like, did, I, did we talk about this guy? Oh, I, I am the absolute, <laughs> I you know, I'm the absolute worst about that. Yeah. James Hong. He was in an episode. The cast for that goes on forever, which I just have to assume that his illness got in the way of them ever, you know, showing that on TV or something. Gotcha. But I didn't look at the years that it like spanned and stuff. So I can't even find it now. Well, maybe that's uh, for the best. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Should we introduce the show or anything? Sure. Have we reached the point where we just don't even have to do that anymore? Um, or we don't even really care, right? Yeah. I mean, there's that too. <laughs> Apathy. Hey guys, welcome to the moratorium. Yeah. Uh, I'm your host. Uh, I know you're not going to listen to this, Cornman. but just in case, here's my <laughs> living will. With me as always is... <laughs> Sound like Eeyore. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> All right, welcome to the moratorium. Is that better? Yeah. Ah, I'm your host. You sound way more upbeat now. Tim Cornman. And with me as always is... Me. Just me. Sexy, sultry, Jason Walker. This is the real me when I'm on the podcast. (laughs) Is that it? Yeah. Put all the masks aside. Did we say that James Hong, was he in... Yeah, he he was in The Golden Child. (laughs) I caught part of The Golden Child the other day. Yeah. And I was going to bed, and I had to turn it off, because otherwise I was just going to stay up and watch the entire thing. Yeah. That is a fun movie. Yeah, I like it. It really is. I like it a lot. Eddie Murphy has, I mean, during that period of time, he was just like, just an entertaining motherfucker. The Golden Child was uh, directed by Michael Ritchie. Michael Ritchie was uncredited as the director of Student Bodies. Okay. I'm not taking the bait this time. <laughs> <laughs> he also did The Survivors, Fletch, Wildcats, The Couch Trip. Basically. Digstown, Fletch Lives. We talked yeah, about this guy before. Yeah. It's a real sweet spot for me. I would watch all those movies right now. Stop in the podcast. I got movies to watch. Yeah, I got some stuff to do. Wait a minute. What am I talking about? I usually just watch a movie while we're doing the podcast. So I've got some good stuff to go down today, but... Uh, well, let's just tell our audience, you know, we just came off of a mega monster movie mayhem. Mm-hmm. MMM. Is that what I called it? I can't recall. Mania. It was kind of a mania. Starring MMM at Walsh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm working on a t-shirt for a commemorative t-shirt, and so far it's been shot down twice. I don't know why. I guess you can't put gratuitous nudity on a t-shirt. Oh. I don't know. Well, they should say that right up front, so you don't waste time. Exactly. Maybe I need to size down certain sizable things. No, that was funnier in my head. Size down certain (laughs) sizable things. That sounds like a uh, (laughs) something they make people who stutter say. (laughs) Oh, that's good. It's like Susie selling seashells by the seashore. Well, so coming off this 
movie marathon, movie ma- mania. It was a mania. It's been like weeks since we've seen The Hidden. <laughs> yes, that does seem like a long time ago. I feel like there should be a lot more said about The Hidden. I did not do any more research because we watched so many movies. Yeah. I really wanted to find out what the budget was on the vehicles, on the cars that they yes. just totally destroyed. Yes, if he had a, if the director or writer had a friend that owned a dealership mm-hmm. where he could like write them off somehow. I have nothing. Hmm. I did a very piss poor job on doing any research on the hidden. So did you, did you come up with anything? Uh, no. Okay, I don't feel so bad now. I don't think there's a lot to say. It speaks for itself, I guess, you know? If you really get mired down and like, well, how much was that Lamborghini that they just blew up? Mm -hmm. Then you're just missing out on that Lamborghini blowing up, right? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Just enjoy it for art's sake, you know? And I think a lot of people really hold this movie in high regards. I mean, it was a lot of fun. Our friend Kirk texted me just last night. And yeah. said that he had no idea that we had done The Hidden. Uh, and he was very excited about it. Yeah, we're going to have to get him on the show really soon. Yeah. He also kind of bugged me about that, too. Uh, I'm like, hey, look, we barely show up for it. How are we supposed to? <laughs> we won't do his movie until. we. I'm sure we could make a, a yarn to his movie. Yeah. Which we're not yeah, even going to state what his movie is. We're not going to, no spoilers here for future episodes. We only spoil movies for you. We're not spoiling yeah. our podcast. Right. <laughs> we should charge extra. Yeah. For that service. All right. So, uh, man, I mean, we've watched a lot of movies. Uh, we just came off of Halloween. Mm-hmm. What do you got for me? I don't know if I've ever said it. Uh, on the show before, but um, we watched um, Host again uh, this last week, and mm-hmm. it's just such a good, it's perfectly paced, scary movie. And it kind of falls in the found footage category, because it's all done on Zoom, and uh, it's just really smart filmmaking and really good actors, and everybody should watch that. It's on Shudder. I still haven't watched it. Oh, it's so good. It genuinely freaked me out a couple of times. I, I had really? a couple of jumps in it that that doesn't usually happen. And it doesn't have any real notable names in here. I no. don't know any of these people. I only know the story about it vaguely, but, you know, they're just all, you know, actors that couldn't do anything. We're sitting around the house because of quarantine and... um I don't know if it already had existed or if the idea came from, you know, just kind of actor friends hanging out, Mm -hmm. chatting, and decided to shoot a movie. Yeah, it has uh, three different writers on it, so that's probably, yeah. hey, what can we do for cheap and produce right now? Yeah. It's only 57 minutes long? Uh, Yeah, it's not. It goes by really quick. Well, shit. It doesn't waste any time with anything. All right, well, let's shut this off. I got an hour. I'll okay. Look. All right, I'll, uh, good night, guys. Calm. All right, good Next night. week movie is uh, <laughs> Going Ape. Oh, Again. I wish. I think you're being a little, <laughs> you're teasing me is what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, we're going to make a, a a good yarn today. It's going to be a short yarn, and uh, but it's going to be fun, actually. Since you already brought it up, let's go ahead and get this out of the way, okay? That uh, we had another request from listener Nick. Uh, This could be Nick the Dick from uh, Bachelor Party. He goes by Mr. Dick. (laughs) (laughs) Is that, uh, that's not Adrian Zemed, is it? No, he wasn't Nick the Dick. Okay. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. You don't remember? You have (sighs) perfect recall of that. (laughs) Total recall of that movie. I do not. There was one scene where they're throwing beer cans at uh, Adrian Zemed, and Mm -hmm. one bounces up perfectly into his hand, (laughs) and 
I, I don't know if it was planned or if it uh-huh. was shot in reverse, but it was perfect. I love it when that happens. It's like in an animal house, that like perfect beer bottle catch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. Let's just run down all of the great catches that okay. we might think have been uh, improvised. Oh, I didn't. I guess I didn't realize that was Michael Dudikoff <laughs> in fucking <laughs> like Bachelor Party. What? Yeah. Yeah, he's oh one of the God. main characters. I'm not taking the bait. I'm not clicking that <laughs> on that, but I I don't know what to do. I feel weird about this. I feel like I ought to uh, contest it somehow. Here it is. Brett Baxter Clark played Nick the Dick. I thought you should know that. <laughs> Dang it. Now I'm going to have to open a bachelor party tab. Uh, Damn you, Tim. He got to start in meatballs. He was a Chippendales dancer in Double Exposure. Didn't see that, but anyway, that's enough of that. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Now I'm going to just drop you off right there. I thought we were going to. Oh well. Yeah. Yeah, there he is, Michael Dudikoff. Yeah. <laughs> is he one I just of the bad saw him guys? For some reason, no, no, he's not. He's one of the partiers. He's one of the friends. Yeah. He was the American Ninja. Yeah, of course yeah. he was. I just came upon him for a, just a brief moment. Um, oh, I'm going to... No, I can't tell you about it. We'll get to that. He's in my yarn, kind of. Oh, okay. So, Oh, I see him on the... Uh, he's got that big hair in uh, the on the cover of the movie. Mm-hmm. Is that you in the far in the bottom right? Oh, yeah, that's me. With, with that, that fake mustache on? <laughs> <laughs> that was Barry Diamond? No, that's Rudy. Sorry. I wish I had a friend named Rudy. <laughs> wish you had a friend named Rudy? Yeah. Rudy? Tootie. <laughs> <Sorry. That's it. laughs> In my Martin Balsam voice. <laughs> That's awesome. Rudy? Tootie. <laughs> All right. But listener Rick, Nick, oh my God. <laughs> oh, you want to just stop and try it next uh, week? Yeah. It's not working. Yeah, this is... <laughs> I am way too sober for this. Uh, That's what I was thinking. All right. Listener Nick asked us to check out a movie, and I watched it uh, Friday night. It's called uh, The Beast, also known as The Beast of War. Now, I don't know. Do you believe me? Because I could not find evidence that it was shortened to The Beast. So anyway, all I know is that It was on, you know, it was just one of those movies that was on HBO or Cinemax back in the day, and they just played it relentlessly. Like, I had to have seen it 20 times. When did this come out? Uh, I want to say late 80s. 88. 88. Gosh, and it's almost two hours long. I mean, when I was telling you that I had seen it so many times, I I guess what I meant was it was just playing constantly because i i don't remember a thing about it except that jason patrick was in it and he was like smeared with like tank oil Mm -hmm. or something the entire time well it also stars stephen baldwin does anything truly star stephen baldwin you you really have a point (laughs) i think i liked him in one movie and that wasn't uh biodome (laughs) (laughs) oh uh he was in um usual suspects and i like that scene with the guy from uh pulp fiction he flips his cigarette into his face and it mm-hmm. almost starts a fight and that, that's that was pretty cool he was okay in that movie i don't think he was supposed to get hit in the face with the cigarette <laughs> no it was very close to his eye but uh it was a cool scene but uh the beast reads a soviet tank and its warring crew Become separated from their patrol and lost in an Afghan valley with a group of vengeance-seeking rebels on their tracks. Sounds exciting. So 90% of this movie is in and around this damn tank. Yes. Of them just going around in circles and fighting amongst themselves. and Yeah. It's like tank porn. Yeah. It's like porno for like sweaty men in basements that just like put (laughs) models together and shit. I I think it did a pretty good job on um, the claustrophobia inside the tank because there were a lot of people in the tank. Oh my God. 
And you know that they're just eating rations and stuff and just like farting that place up. <laughs> it's a very <laughs> enclosed area. I'm going to leave the lid off for a while. <laughs> the lid. I don't know what tank parts sure. are called. Hatch. We call it the hatch. hatch. I bet you yeah. I bet you a million bucks it's called a hatch. Somebody prove us wrong. Yeah. Come on. Come at us. Jason Patrick, uh, I thought he did a good job in this. I mean, it was an interesting yeah. movie because the uh, is he the owner of the tank? I, don't I know. have no idea. This is George Dezunza. Dezun- I can't even say his name. Yeah, yeah. That's Zun- Zunza. <laughs> Zunza. I instantly knew that face. I mean, I recognized that face. But I couldn't really. It wasn't until I just clicked on him. I'm like, oh, shit. That's a basic instinct. Yeah. He played Gus. Yeah. I guess that's probably what I know him from the most. And I watched part of uh, Basic Instinct the other day. Really? Want to guess which part? <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, I watched. It was the very beginning. <laughs> Where you see the beaver. The, the beaver. Beave. Anyway, I enjoyed this movie. I mean, granted, it's a lot of, you know, running around the desert, a lot of subtitles because, you know, there's a Afghan soldiers just running around, just taking as many guns as they can off their victims and try- just chasing down this tank on foot. The whole movie makes you want a Gatorade really bad. Yeah. <laughs> Replenish your electrolytes. Very dry movie. The way that they set up different traps. Mm-hmm. for the the afghans that were following them mm-hmm. every water supply they came across they they tainted it with strychnine jesus it's really dark it was just very dark well that's what i remember is boring and depressing yeah now why did that guy want us to do that again <laughs> uh just because it uh really had a no real play at the box office yeah right that guy that was also in Casualties of War, um, Don Harvey. Okay. He kind of played the same. I, I assume he played the same character. He's always kind of a asshole, but like kind of a specifically weird kind of asshole. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he's just got one of those faces that you're just like, guy's an asshole. He is pretty much an asshole throughout the entire yeah. thing. Uh, it does say here that it had a budget of eight million dollars and it grossed a hundred and sixty one thousand dollars at the box office. <laughs> Not good. Nope. Lost a bit of money there. Is it filmed in Afghanistan? Just seems like California doesn't have that much And as far as we know, they could have been just doing circles, you know. Maybe. Filming locations, Israel. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, also known as The Beast. Boom, we can end the podcast now. Yes. All right. Good night. Okay, so I think the bigger story is why in the hell did Jason Patrick never really like, I mean, I feel like he was in that like sweet spot of my childhood where he was in everything for a couple of years. He was in Lost Boys. He was in Solar Babies. With all the Brat Pack people, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, he basically was a Brat Packer, kind of. Mm -hmm. You're wondering why Solar Babies didn't, like, enhance (laughs) his career? Maybe that was it. It just (laughs) killed him and Jamie Gertz, and you just never saw him again. Uh He was in Sleepers, but that, uh, very dark movie. Yeah. I only appreciated that movie, really, later on. I went to the theater to see that. Oh. Um, I think just because of everybody in it, you know, mm-hmm. and then probably not realizing what the plot was, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> which I do like the revenge part of it, but man, it just takes you so long to like get to that part, you know? Oh yeah. He was in speed too. Yep. Speed two probably helped kill his career. I, I absolutely hated that film. Was that Yui Bowl? No. Jeanne de Bont. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Debont. Or Jan Debont? Jan Debont. Jan Debont. Yeah. That was a stinky movie. He was a director of photography for Cujo. Yeah. Yeah. Jan Debont. Also, Colleen Camp is in 
speed too. I don't know. Mm, wow. He mentioned that years ago when this podcast started. It looks like he did direct the first speed twister and speed two. Right. Right. Cruise control, I think, is the uh, sub. <laughs> it was just bad. <laughs> they're on a fucking cruise. <laughs> it was just bad. It would be funny if they had to keep the boat at a certain, like, 55 oh, right. knots. Knots. <laughs> <laughs> That's just, good. I fucking hate boat movies, except really? for Jaws. Oh, okay. That's good. Name another boat movie, then. <laughs> It's like name of the tank movie, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, really. Just like, what are the slowest modes of transportation? <laughs> Let's make an action movie about that. <laughs> it's already just boring. I will say, though, I, I kind of enjoyed watching The Beast. I mean, it had some yeah. good highlights. I mean, I was doing some dusting while I Yeah, was... <laughs> folding clothes. What made it weird is that I really thought Jason Patrick and Stephen Baldwin and all these other actors, mm -hmm. they are Americans. Uh-huh. And they are they were actually supposed to be Soviet. Okay. I mean, Jason Patrick's name is Konstantin Korvanchenko. Right. So is it one of those weird things where they just decided to have them speak in American because it was being released in... I guess. That's confusing. Yeah. That's why I was like, well, how did I really wanted to know how they got mixed in? Because I thought they were Americans in this war fighting with this Soviet guy who just happens to have this tank and these wild stories about making it out alive in several different wars and didn't want to leave his tank behind. Right. But no, I guess they're all together because Stephen Baldwin is uh, Anthony Golikov. You know, and him being like Russian or whatever is like laughable. He incurs a uh, a blast. I think that they were under the tank and somebody threw a uh, grenade yeah. close to him. And, it, and through half the movie, he has one of those silly bandages around his head, you know, <laughs> yeah. where it goes <laughs> under his jaw and <laughs> <Right>. around his <laughs> around his forehead. Yeah. Like he's out of it for the rest yeah. of it. He's like <laughs> Eric Stoltz in anaconda it's like here's an actor you might recognize <laughs> he's not gonna fucking do anything <laughs> here he is though don harvey was snickers in hudson hawk i just wanted to, <laughs> I just that. to say that <laughs> snickers they all had candy bar names and they all ate the candy bars that they were oh did they named after they're at uh what is it southby's or you know one of those, like, super prestigious, like, uh, auction houses. Auction house, yeah. David Crusoe's eating a Kit Kat, I think, <laughs> in the auction. Uh, he was also in Tank Girl, uh, Better Off Dead. And I also forget that that's Naomi Watts with black hair. In what? In um, Tank Girl. She's, like, the nerdy really? girl with I glasses. I didn't get that either. Yeah. My wife absolutely oh, loves that movie. I, I know. Ice T <laughs> is in that movie as a kangaroo. Yes. <laughs> Why are we not talking about that movie? Well, I guess we are talking about it, but. So anyway. Anyway. Uh, I guess that's another tank movie. Maybe uh, a more fun <laughs> tank movie God. is Tank Girl. Uh, there you go. Let's, let's just change the format of the podcast <laughs> <laughs> Only do what was the one with uh, Eddie Murphy and like Dan Aykroyd or uh, best it? defense? No, it was Dudley James Moore. Garner. <laughs> I always get those confused. That was just Tank, and that was James uh, Garner and C. Thomas Howell. Is that oh, correct? Okay, now I gotta look up that. Yeah, Tank was 1984. Wow, and yes, I was correct. That was also Shirley Jones. Okay. James Cromwell. Not available on any streaming service now <laughs> or in the future. <laughs> you can only find it on Laserdisc. I think I had that on Laserdisc. Ooh. All right. So there's our tank movies. The Beast, <laughs> tank. tank Girl, and <laughs> Tank. That's it. Yes. The I guess one of the love interests, Jenna Lee Harrison. 
picture number nine on IMDb for Tank, you're welcome. Okay, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know where we were going there for a second. <laughs> Let's stop the podcast and watch Tank. I, I think so. Know. Oh, okay. I get it now. Jenna Lee Harrison, she was... Remember when she was in everything? She was Cindy Snow in Three's Company. Okay, yeah, right. I knew that there was a uh, there was a sitcom with her in it. Mm-hmm. She was in seventy episodes of uh, Dallas. She was a Ewing. Oh, maybe that's where I yeah. yeah. I look at the volume of her hair, and now I can mm-hmm. see them. <laughs> now you got it. I see James Cromwell in that. He's like six foot five or something. Oh yeah, towering over seats on the sound. I love him. He's in Murder by Death, which I've been thinking about a lot lately. Did you watch it for uh, Halloween? Um, It would be fine for Halloween, but, you know, not exactly scary. It's just a whodunit, but I encourage everyone to watch that movie. It's brilliant. Can I please close off the Beast uh, tab? Yeah, you can close off the Beast, but then look at uh, picture 11 on IMDb for Tank. (laughs) And you're welcome. (laughs) This better not be James Garner with his nips poking out. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I saw that one already. It's hypnotizing. It is is now my background. (laughs) It's like one of those magic eye pictures. If you like stare at it long enough, it becomes Mm -hmm. like a 3D. It's a schooner. (laughs) You dumb son of a bitch. Uh, I think I got my movies mixed up there. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Done with tanks in general. Tanks, plural. All right, clicking it off. I want to bring up one thing here before we get started with our regularly scheduled program. Okay. I had like six tabs open of guys that I was talking about doing. This is why I wanted to talk about this guy, though. Larry Cedar. Yes. Okay, Larry Cedar was in The Hidden. He played Brim. I don't know who he was in the movie. His picture on IMDb is very reminiscent to Chris Elliott's character in <laughs> Scary Movie 2. Yes, with the strong arm. <laughs> oh, yeah. We well, you know this guy. I mean, he's like, you know, he's in everything. He's been in 204 credits here. Yeah. And he is the quote unquote character actor yeah exactly he has done voice acting uh i think i read in his trivia that he enjoys being in full makeup where you can't recognize yeah him. he's kind of a doug jones of uh, type of guy in his trivia here on imdb specializes in the art of speed talking <laughs> going by the nickname disclaimerman and this is uh, I guess stuck with him because he was doing the disclaimers for like different commercials. Oh, you know? I, see, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. He just reads all that legal mumbo jumbo really fast. Yeah. He's been the voice of Volkswagen radio commercial legal disclaimers. I love it when those people just like kind of carve out those little mm-hmm. careers. Just and that's awesome. Uh, he was a percussionist for the 80s punk band Clownhead Hammer, which was close to landing a record deal when the group's lead singer quit the group, thus breaking up the band. Oh, man. I know. Just think of what we could. They could have been so much. Yeah. See, this says that he was an auctioneer in this last uh, season of American Horror Story, the slasher one. Oh, great. So. A professional acting chameleon, it says, Larry loves to disappear into his characters and considers the greatest compliment when he is told he is unrecognizable in a role. Well, as long as he's blending in as being a (laughs) six foot five redheaded weirdo. I mean, yeah, he blends right in. But this guy has been in a ton of shit. Doogie Going Howser. way back, 1978, got a start in Battlestar Galactica. Cool. Uh, Magical World of Disney. Paper Chase. MASH. Remington Steel. Are you going to mention Twilight Zone? 
First, I wanted to mention that he was the Snake Man in Dreamscape. No way. Yes, way. That makes me want to watch that. Now, I haven't seen um, that in a long time. I really, really like Dreamscape, and oh, I'm going to yeah. come back. Uh, well, we're going to talk about it here in just a second, too. We'll just keep going here. Uh, he was in Night Watch. He was a waiter in the movie Night oh, Watch. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, and we talked about this just recently, and I yeah. really enjoyed this movie. Oh, yeah. But the director, writer-director is Ole or Old Born, Borndahl, whatever. He's Danish. There is a Danish version of Night Watch called Natavad Vat I don't whatever the fuck it is. Natavagton. Yeah. So it came out first. Did he direct that? Oh, he wrote that. Yeah. But he also wrote and directed the American version. American version too. Cool. That's a cool little creepy movie. In 1993, he did a TV movie called Masturbator. <laughs> what? <laughs> is that Danish TV? That's, a, that's Danish TV. It's fine on Danish TV to just have, like, <laughs> explicit sex. And that was, a disturbed loner cannot tell the difference between fantasy and reality. You're not fucking with me? That is a real thing? That's a real thing. TV wow. movie. It was only an hour long. Okay. Can you really call it a TV movie? I don't know. So, but there is a Nata Vadkin 2 in the works right now. It's been announced. I don't really remember the plot. Wasn't there a twist at the end, but I don't really remember what it is. In Nightwatch? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was I'm pretty, sure. uh, it was twisty. I mean, it was, it, I enjoyed it just because it's Ewan McGregor, Nick Nolte, Josh Brolin. Yeah. Nick Nolte before he. Oh, Nick Nolte was a uh, creep before he was a dumpster diver. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that they made four Watchers movies? I just looked at that. Good yes, Lord. Why? I only watched half of the first one. I know. Holy crap! And Mark Hamill's in Watchers Four. Oh boy, Lou Rawls, Lisa Wilcox. Who is she? She sounds familiar. Lou Rawls. <laughs> That's weird. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, Lisa Wilcox, she was Alice in Nightmare on Elm Street 4 and came back for part five, I believe. Yes. Ah. Well, you know what's weird is that in order to talk about those movies, that's going to have to be like a special segment. Yeah. Our podcast is like reverse. We can only talk about like really good movies as like a a side. (laughs) As a sidebar. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Which is fine with me. Wow. Now I kind of want to watch Watchers 4 just to see how bad it is. Man, wasn't Corey Haim uh, in the first one? Yes. John Carl Buchler. We've talked about Buchler before, yeah, right? Yeah, special effects. He directed Watchers 4. Oh, I'm sure we said that. Wow. We had to. We need to be like a continuity person. Anyway, let's uh, get back on track here. Larry Cedar. I just wanted to bring him up just because he has a very prolific career, but he's not my deep dive. Okay. Well, I was just going to say that you can shave off chips of him and put him in your closet uh, to keep right. like bugs and stuff. <laughs> he did a lot of voice acting as well. He he was in uh, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4. Dude. He's in part three. Mm. <laughs> he's also in uh, Pinky and the Brain, I think. Yes. Several voices. Mm, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Freakazoid. Now, is that... Oh, love Freakazoid. I don't think I've ever seen that. Really? Nope. It's a kid that gets zapped into the internet, and it turns him into kind of like a Beetlejuice sort of... Well, not Beetlejuice, really, I guess, but like a weirdo superhero. Okay. I remember it being very funny. He was also in a movie called Jackson's Hole. (laughs) <laughs> in 2020. So. <laughs> All right. So anyway, the reason why I wanted to bring up Larry Cedar too was to look at Dreamscape. Okay. Okay. Let's do it. But that's when I got a connection to Eddie Albert. Okay. Okay. And I wanted to bring up Eddie Albert just because, you know, we know him from Green Acres. <laughs> yes. Right. But, but I guess he was all over TV and 
tons and tons of things. Now, he played the president in Dreamscape. Okay. If you remember, the whole thing was uh, they were trying to assassinate the president by killing him in his dreams. In his dreams, right. By using a psychic power to insert yourself into somebody else's dream. It's kind of like Inception a little bit. I would say so. Ooh, he was in Escape to Witch Mountain. Was cool. Yes. He was in a TV series called Switch with Robert Wagner. He was a, was a buddy cop detective agency type show. <laughs> Eddie Albert, Robert Wagner. Wow. That's a, lot of, again. that's a lot of face. He was in a movie called Whiffs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just wanted to say that. Why I don't did know you why. say it like that? Say I it again. Know. Whiffs. I don't know what that is. Uh-huh. Whiffs is a, a private applies to be a test subject for the military's new chemical weapons program. Like a flubber type situation? I guess. But I clicked on that because it had Elliot Gould, Eddie Albert, Jennifer O'Neill, uh, Richard Masur, Howard Hessman. Dr. Johnny Fever. You say Mauser, don't you? I Richard do, Mauser. and it's not that at all. There is not a U in there. Well, there is. It's M A S U R. Well, yeah, but I mean, like, it, that's not. It is Masur. Oh man, <laughs> we get everybody's name wrong. I had so many different channels to go through. Take this job and shove it. An Eddie Albert movie, which had Robert Hayes, Barbara Hershey, David Keith, Tim Thomerson, Wow, Martin Mull, Art Carney, Royal Dano, and James Karen. Jesus, that's like... <laughs> Talk about face. <laughs> like you could sew all those faces together and they would go around the uh, the world. <laughs> and this is... Uh, and the Allison Group has bought four beer breweries in difficulties. It's <laughs> a weird way to say that. The young but rising manager, Frank Macklin, is sent to reorganize like them. A blast. Take this job and shove it. Is uh, Dabney Coleman in that one? Uh, I came across Dabney earlier. He had to have auditioned he, for yeah. one of those. Hey, Eddie <laughs> Albert is also in um, The Devil's Reign, that uh, Satanist movie with Ernest Borgnine and William Shatner. We were talking oh, about cool. that. Seems like a long yeah. time ago, but it really was just a couple weeks ago. So, anyway, Eddie Albert, I wanted to read his trivia here. Okay. Eddie Albert did live, live to be, I think he was just shy of his 99th birthday. Wow. He served in the Navy during World War II. Okay. He was hired by the United States government and went on what appeared to be a pleasure sailing expedition in Mexican waters. What he was actually doing was gathering reportable information on Nazi and Japanese activities in and around two Mexican territories on the Baja California Peninsula. Okay. He was a spy. That's awesome. <laughs> I, I was like, holy crap. You don't immediately say like, well, he's a spy when you look at Eddie Albert. That is interesting. That is interesting. Do you Very think he's ever assassinated someone? Like, you know, behind, come behind a guy with like a garrote wire and just <laughs> snap his head off. He turned down the roles for My Three Sons and Mr. Ed in order to actively pursue his movie career. Hmm. He presided over a game show and two variety shows in the 1950s. I think you're required to. Yeah. I was going to do a deep dive on him, but granted, he... He is a character yeah. actor, just a very well-known right. character actor. Or he was. We could talk about Return to Green Acres all day long, but we don't have that kind of time. <laughs> I mean, we do, but... Yeah. He guest starred on the very first episode of The Fall Guy. I love that show so much. There is a lot, a lot of trivia on him, but it, a lot of it's just like, uh, oh, he sang in the church choir. Yeah, there's nothing like... Besides him being a spy, there's <laughs> right, exactly. Really it almost <laughs> now I'm kind of I look at his career and I'm like, hmm, a secret agenda. So very interesting, Eddie Albert. He died in just recently, I think, 2005, at the age of 99. Wow. It says and two first names. 
Well, that wasn't his uh, his real name, of course. Right, I forgot. He was Eddie Albert Heimberger. I don't wonder why he didn't stick with that name. <laughs> <laughs> Have a Heimberger with cheese and uh, just hold the pickles, please. Thank you. They serve it on one of those pretzel buns. You got a ciabatta back there? <laughs> <laughs> Whose dick do I have to suck for some ciabatta around here, huh? Well, no, Eddie Albert's been in a ton of shit, but a lot of it, like, just TV shows. Who is he in Beverly Hillbillies? Uh, you know what? One of these days, we're going to have to do a breakdown. I mean, this is going to take some time, but we're going to have to do a breakdown of, like, all the shared universes in old TV, you know? Mm-hmm. Because, like, Gomer Pyle and, uh, and uh, Andy Griffith and, you know. Well, Petticoat Junction was the origin of his the character in Green Acres. Green Acres. Huh. Yes. The Petticoat Junctionverse. Junctionverse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was a good try. It was a very good try. It's just, just working with what I got here. So anyway, I just wanted to bring up Eddie Albert for that reason. Do you really think that they, every time Mr. Ed talked, that they were just like shoving a cattle prod in his ass? <laughs> <laughs> back then they could do anything yeah so all right do you want me to go straight into my uh deep dive now yeah, sure you do your deep dive i'll do mine and then you can do the yarn that'll break us up a little bit more okay wait you do the yeah. yarn oh right it is my yarn <sighs> shit no you got the goratory yeah I just threw you for a, a loop, I didn't was, you? Like, holy shit, I gotta come up with a movie? I had a slightly elevated heart rate for a couple of seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and then now it's gone down. Uh, uh, look, maybe we should apologize to our audience or whoever's listening to this that, yeah, it's been a couple of weeks since we've done a, an actual moratorium or yarn wall, yeah. so it's kind of like we're all disjointed yes, right now. I, I'm double jointed. <laughs> yes, I feel like I'm off a little bit. Haven't quite gotten into the rhythm of it. Right. But let's get started here, and I'll go right into my deep dive. Okay. Okay. And my deep dive today is a guy that I, I know sometime in the future we're probably going to pick the same character actor. We ha just we have to. The law of averages says that yeah. we will. If there was anybody that we we're going to pick the same, <laughs> it would be it could it could have been this guy okay, right here. Great. Because we love him. But we probably didn't recognize him in his early career. We just know him from the last 20 years. Okay. Or maybe even more than that. I don't know what to... I, what is what is this year? <laughs> it's 2020 still. Uh, still 2020? Yep. Fuck. Longest year in history. It's, it's the longest and also has been flying by somehow. <laughs> I don't know how that is possible, but... All right. So this guy... Let's come out and say him, Mr. Michael Parks. Yay. I just watched a movie with Michael Parks the other day. Yeah? What was it? It was a Rift Tracks movie, and it was called um, Spiker. Mm, Spiker. It is about a men's Olympic volleyball team, and Michael Parks oh, is yeah. the coach. <laughs> I remember this box. I've never seen it. Oh, it's, it's... But I remember that box. It's everything that you could imagine, and... It turns out that he plays kind of a gruff asshole. Who would have thought, you know? Yeah. Well, Michael Parks has been in a ton of things. Yeah. He really has. But like I said, we probably didn't recognize him until, you know, he was in From Dust Till Dawn. I know I had seen him before that movie, but that's the first time that I really noticed him. But he was a stud back in the day. Oh, yeah. Very good looking in his early yeah. career. I, I looked at some pictures. I was like, holy shit. Uh, he was born Harry Samuel Parks. <laughs> Michael's not in there anywhere. <laughs> no, Six foot not. tall. He was married five times. Okay. From He got married in 1956. Holy shit. He was 16. Wow. wow. <laughs> it, that's crazy. Yeah. He was born in 1940, died in 2017. Anyway, his trademark is calm, gravelly voice. Mm -hmm. See, that's like the opposite, calm and gravelly to me. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, yeah, I guess you could be calm and gravelly. And his trivia here, 
lived on a yacht in Monterey, California in the early 1980s. Fuck yeah, dude. The theme song, Long Lonesome Highway, Mm -hmm. from Park's TV series Then Came Bronson, Mm -hmm. 1969, was sung by himself. Really? I did not know that. I have actually seen Then Came Bronson. Really? I've never seen it. It was a kind of failed show, wasn't it? Was it only on for a season or like a few episodes? Uh, I it was on for a little bit longer, but it wasn't a whole whole lot. Is he like a teacher or something? I'll I'll read it off here. Then came Bronson. Okay, a disillusioned reporter, James Jim Bronson, quits his job and starts wandering the road on his Harley Davidson motorcycle as a form of soul searching. He meets various characters. Some he helps, others he educates. So it's like kung fu on a motorcycle. Highway to Heaven. If it was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's both of those. It was on for one season, 27 episodes. Wow. Damn. That's a lot of episodes. He was the only one in it that was like the returning character. I guess every week he was in a different town, different people. Bonnie Bedelia. Right. Bruce Dern. Jack Klugman. Wow. Keenan Wynn. God, he's in everything. Dabney Coleman, that's where he was. One episode, 1969. Cool. I'd be interested in watching it. Oh, yeah, for sure. Just to see him, because he was uh, young. That was, when did we say 69? He was 29 years old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's just. But, yeah, he was a handsome guy then. When he got his start, there were some pictures of him that I was, I just didn't believe it was him. Yeah. Well, he, I think he did a few uh, Westerns, and he's got, like, they dyed his hair really dark. Yeah, he was in Zane Grey Theater. It's where he got his start in 1960. Uh, the Real McCoys, Gunsmoke, The Detectives, 1961 series, Perry Mason. But there is a uh, oh, yeah. Bus Riley's Back in Town. I clicked on that. It has Anne Margaret and... Michael Parks, and I oh, guess they're right. like star-crossed lovers type. But if you look at his pics in that, it's like, hmm. oh, man, it's it's hmm. like somebody uh, Vigo. Yeah, he. You're right. He does kind of have a uh, that pompadour. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to think of like who he looked like too, but yeah, he's just got one of those like rugged. But yeah, he looks awesome in this. It was 1965, but it also had. Jocelyn Brando. Talked about her recently. Larry Storch. Holy shit. Kim Darby. Oh, boy. She had to be oh, really yeah. young in that, too. She played Gussie. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to be a girl whose name is Gussie. Is that short for something? I guess. Gassandra. <laughs> oh, my God. I was going to say the exact same thing. We need to. We must quit. We've really stopped talking during the week just so we could save it for the podcast. Yes. Yes. Our friendship is hurting (laughs) because of this. But But that was Bus Riley is back in town. He played JFK. No, he played Robert Kennedy in The Private Hmm. Files of J. Edgar Hoover. I think that must be like a kind of action-y... Um... The Private Files of J. Edgar Hoover. Oh, wow. 1977. That cast is crazy. 1966, he was in The Bible, The Beginning. He played Adam. Yeah. In 1977, Michael Parks was in a movie called Sidewinder 1. A veteran motorcycle racer does a deal with a rich industrialist to ride his specialized custom-designed bike, Sidewinder 1. It's Marjo Gortner, Charlotte Ray. Man. Yes, Mrs. Garrett. (laughs) The big man. Oh, yeah. And a guy by the name of Alex Cord. And I clicked on him because I'm like, "Eh, he kind of sounded familiar. I don't recognize him. But I just looked through his shit real quick. He, to me, seems like a stuntman turned actor or something, you know? But yeah, his face, you can see. I mean, he was in a ton of stuff back in the day. Mm -hmm. He was an airwolf. He did several characters on Fantasy Island. 
Uh, anyway, Alex Cord was in a movie called The Chosen Survivors. All right. And I had to look at okay. this because it was, it was, it sounded interesting. And the cover made me think it was a vampire movie. <laughs> so. There is a bat on the cover of it. I mean, you weren't, <laughs> you didn't come up with that on your own. There is a huge, like, outline of a bat. Yes. You know what? I have seen this movie. Oh, really? I don't know why. I might have looked it up because of, um, I really like American Horror Story. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember if it was last year's or the year before, but they did kind of a apocalypse, you know, right, was the right. theme. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they had these like bunkers. Right. And people like, unbeknownst to them, were qualified to be, you know, chosen survivors. It reads, though, a group of diverse individuals are suddenly taken from their homes and flown via helicopter to a futuristic bomb shelter in the desert, one third of a mile below the surface of the Earth. There they learn that a nuclear holocaust is taking place and that they've been chosen by a computer to survive in the shelter in order right. to continue the human race, just like you said. Right. Right. The shelter is designed to allow people to exist underground comfortably for years, but they are faced with a threat nobody could have predicted. A colony of thousands of bloodthirsty vampire bats find their way into the shelter oh my God. and launches a series of vicious attacks where they claim the humans one by one. But they're bats. <laughs> How do they open a door? <laughs> That's right. How do they work a freaking console panel? Look at picture number six. It's like they took two ideas and just like mashed them together. Mm hmm. I know why I was looking this up now. It's because of, uh, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce his last name. Jekyll? Jekyll? Richard Jekyll? Okay. One of these days, he's going to be one of my deep dives because he's right. literally in all of these movies. Wow, 193 credits. He's in all all of the 70s stuff. He was in um, Day of the Animals, I think, which okay. was Leslie Nielsen. You get to see Leslie Nielsen out without a shirt on in this movie, <laughs> which right. is insane. <laughs> it was like Night of the Lethus or, you know, those movies where, uh, like, when animals attack or something. We need to have more animal attack movies. Yeah. Well, yeah. there's been a few of them lately. Have you seen Crawl? That was good. That was fun. Yeah, that was good. Anyway, Chosen Survivors. I want to get my eyes on this. I'm I'm curious. There's, the pictures are crazy. Yeah, lots of blood. I'm still just confused about how they're in a super high-tech like underground bunker and still... And <laughs> still this flying <laughs> rats are just causing them problems. Picture number 12. It just shows a girl lying dead face yeah. down on a bed. It looks like Jack the Ripper's been in that room. <laughs> exactly. I was going to say Jackson Pollock, but. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Either one. <laughs> like a Basquiat painting or something. There's just blood everywhere. <laughs> It looks like somebody took, like, a ketchup bottle and just, yeah. like, destroyed a Denny's or something. Hot dogs, anyone? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I don't know why I had to I had to look at that. No, I, I love it. And that wasn't even on the guy I wanted. Yeah, you know, that was I was a... talking about Michael Parks. I just got on a sidebar Yeah. by, what was his name? Alex Cord. Oh, right, yeah. It looks, even his real mustache looks like a fake mustache. <laughs> That's right. Bradford Dillman is in mm -hmm. that, who we talked about for what? In one of these other movies, I s saw another name. I could not figure out where we had talked about him. I think I talked about him uh, for bug movies. Oh, is that right? He was in The Swarm. Ah, uh, Okay. He was in Piranha. Yeah, we did talk about the swarm. Yeah. Man, that seems so long ago. I know. <laughs> oh, he was in Bug. Whoa, weird. Like, he is typecast as the guy to deal with uh, bugs when they ah, go. Ah, he's the exterminator. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> There's one man to call. Mm-hmm. Bradford Dillman. Mm-hmm. For all your bug needs. He just got a big shoe. Yep. <laughs> <That's> still... <laughs> exactly. Um okay, Sidewinder 1 is where all of this started. <laughs> oh, I finally geez. I finally You got back far enough on that? Yeah. Sidewinder 1. Um, okay. Marjo Gortner's name is Digger. <laughs> I already hate this movie. All right. He was also uh, 1977 Love and the Midnight Auto Supply. Yeah, I saw that. You know, <laughs> that moment in time, they gave some of the weirdest names to like. There were a ton of movies kind of like that, right? Yeah. Just super strange titles. Yeah. And it, they to just to get them to stand out. And they were kooky little comedies. I don't know. It's like uh, Welcome Home, Roxy Carmichael. Yeah. <laughs> I think. <laughs> but Love and the Midnight Auto Supply had Colin Camp in it. What did you call her? Colin, Colin Camp. Camp. Yeah. Is it Colin? Did you say Colin? Colin? I'll accept anything that you say. Rory Calhoun was in this movie, mm-hmm. who was the uh, old man in Motel Hill. Oh, he was the he was the butcher in Motel Hill. Huh. So I know we talked about him just recently. We did. I think that movie's on Shutter. But I clicked on the writer director James Polakoff, and I don't know. I guess because I've never heard this name before, I wanted to see what else he had done. Mm-hmm. And he did a movie called Satan's Mistress. Mm. And since I watched Satan's Blade the other day, and I've been just looking at different Satan's movies, I didn't mm-hmm. remember this one at all. It's also, I guess the, the box art says Demon Rage. Ooh. <laughs> so yeah. I like both of those titles are pretty I, good. I do too. Except for when you hear what the what it's about. <laughs> A woman in an unhappy marriage finds sexual fulfillment in her relationship with a ghostly, speechless presence who obviously doesn't quite say who he is. (laughs) What? (laughs) It sounds like a comedy. (laughs) So it's basically the entity if she was into it. Right. That's what it sounds like to me. Huh. And John Carradine's in it. He plays a priest. Well, and the girl is Britt Eklund. Yeah, I just she clicked was in on her. Wicker Man, and she's mm-hmm. in a bunch of British movies, I think. But Satan's Mistresses. I just thought that was plural. Mistress. Sorry. Yeah, Demon Rage doesn't. That doesn't really match the no description. No, you're right. It doesn't. Huh. Well, so did you watch it? Not yet. I'm putting it on my list. Uh, Michael Parks was also in Folks, F-F-O-L-K-E-S. Yeah, I saw that Folks, too. Folks, also known as North Sea Hijack. Both of those titles <laughs> suck of ass. <laughs> sound very good, no. When terrorists take over two oil rigs and threaten to blow them up, if their demands are not met, an eccentric anti-terrorism expert volunteers his unique commando unit to stop them. The commando unit includes Roger Moore, Anthony Perkins, Michael Parks, and James Mason. Who's James Mason? James Mason's the guy from... uh, Uh He was Captain Nemo? No, but he was Captain... um, Kangaroo? Captain Caveman. Oh, he was Captain Nemo, and uh, yeah, Yeah. I kind of forgot about that. (laughs) What what is the movie that I know him the most from? I mean, he was. I think I might get him and John Houseman mixed up. <laughs> Maybe. Give me your best John Houseman. He sounds just like James Mason. <laughs> no, he sounds different. I I can't do it right now. I have to have a certain level of like a a phlegm, have to have throat bubble in the back of my <laughs> cross of iron. No. Oh, he plays Straker in the Salem's Lot TV movie from the 70s. Oh, okay. He's the... Uh, yes! Know, he's like the uh, the human face of the... Right. I remember that now. Oh, he's in Yellowbeard. Man, if you've never seen Yellowbeard... Never seen Yellowbeard. Oh, 
Kirk and I could easily do a couple of hours on Yellowbeard. We've seen it so many damn times. So Michael Parks also did in 1980 The Return of Josie Wells, in which he directed. Whoa, what? Yeah, that was kind of interesting. He played Josie Wells and he directed the movie. Did uh, Clint like lose the name in like a bar? I don't know. I guess so. (laughs) I clicked on uh, Hard Country, which had Jan Michael Vincent, Kim Basinger, Michael Parks, Gaylord Sartain, Tanya Tucker, and Daryl Hannah. Huh. Interesting. Do you know Daryl Hannah's married to Neil Young? Like currently? Currently, I think. Huh. Interesting. (laughs) You keep saying that word. Yep. I think when you say interesting, you mean the opposite. Yeah. Neil Young, she got married to him in uh, July of 2018, and she's still married to him two years. He is in Twin Peaks, which I just remembered. He's kind of a gangster Michael Parks? Yeah, Michael Parks. I was wondering why you didn't bring that up before. I was, I was saving it. I've just remembered. As Jean Renault? Twin Peaks has this, like, you know, of course, a bunch of shady characters, but the the guys that are in on the real dark stuff that uh, Laura was into, when he shows up, then it's like, oh, fuck, he's like the really dangerous dude in the group. And they're all French, I guess. (laughs) Michael Parks is also in a TV series called The Colbys. I love that cheese. Which was a spinoff of Dynasty, hmm. starring Charlton Heston, Tracy Scoggins, Maxwell Caulfield, Barbara Stanwyck. This sounds amazing. It <laughs> sounds utterly horrible. Anyway, that was on for two seasons. Never heard of it. Nightmare Beach. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great title. I love those two words together. Yeah, 1989, after the execution of a motorcycle gang leader convicted of murder, a helmeted biker goes on a killing spree. Well, I'm, at least he's wearing his uh, helmet. Hey, uh, John Saxon's in it. Yes, he is. Staring at a teenage girl like he's going to bite her face. I would watch that. I was about to say, I might watch it too. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting into it. As an Eddie Albert, when you get your... Uh, it's like a piercing when you like. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So in 1996 is when we first really know Michael Parks from from Dust Till Dawn. And that's hard to believe. That was 24 years ago, man. God, we're old. We are old. That little monologue, his delivery of that, of all that dialogue is what makes it so hilarious. Mm-hmm. But he was in Kill Bill, you know. He's in Kill Bill as two different characters. Yes. He's like the pimp. Uh, Esteban. Yeah. <laughs> that accent that he does is insane. Oh, I love it. I know. I'd love to hear, like, how they, like, settled on that. He's like, well, I can do kind of a fakey, like, you know. I don't mm-hmm. even know what he was <laughs> trying. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> Uh, it's like he just hung out with a uh, carotene. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I only assumed that they were like uh, best friends. Yes. Man, that's a dude we need to talk a lot about. We need to have an entire just one podcast about maybe the whole carotene family. That'd be pretty cool, yeah, actually. Jeez. Oh, Before coming an actor, Michael Parks' jobs included picking fruit. Digging ditches, driving trucks, and fighting forest fires. Sounds about right. But when you talk about his monologues, though, my favorite one is in Planet Terror. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Or, no, that was Death Proof. I'm sorry. It was in Grindhouse, but it was in Death Proof when he was talking about uh, two tons of steel. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I forgot. Him and the- Just so a man could shoot his goo. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I need to look that line up because uh, that just butchered every bit of it. But yeah, he's the sa- he's also in Planet Terror. Yes, as the same uh, cop. He was the like the dad to the one chick who like broke her wrist or something, right? Yes, something like that. He's the same character in Kill Bill, also. 
He's yes. Earl McGraw, uh, but then he's also Esteban. Go ahead. Try to pronounce it. Nope. <laughs> nope. I was looking for letters that weren't there. I was going to say Vallejo, but it's Vallejo. Vallejo. <laughs> I don't know. He was a pallbearer for Lenny Bruce. Uh, he was buried at sea. I don't think they scattered his ashes. I think they just cut up bits and pieces of him and just threw him in the sea. Yeah. The way he wanted. Yes. And they said, so long, chum. You know? <laughs> That's... <laughs> The gnashing, that was in post-production when he, Mm. the gnashing and the Mm. summoning. (laughs) What do you think the gnashing is about? I think that is really about him playing a part-time cook Mm -hmm. in a nursing home. Oh my God. It's like the dentures come to life at night and like (laughs) some kind of satanic spell. Now it's writing itself. Oh my God. We need to get it. We need to get on that. The gnashing. Hmm. Or maybe it's ganashing. Oh, that's like that that? like um, kind of chocolatey (laughs) stuff in between cake layers. The ganashing. (laughs) (laughs) That's terrifying. (laughs) <laughs> wow all right so moving on michael parks he will be missed yeah. i enjoyed tusk i know a lot of people yeah, didn't i was wondering if you were going to say something about it i liked it too it was it's strange yeah and i i feel the same way about red state too like there were things that i liked mm. but i think ultimately i i don't think i liked the movie his delivery in red state mm-hmm was incredible. Right. It was. Yeah. I really enjoyed him. He's just really good at long bits of dialogue yeah. and delivering that. All right. So Michael Parks, he will be missed. Yep. R.I.P. Rest in power. I would think that Michael Parks would want to be buried like in a park or like have his ashes spread in a park. And a parking lot. <laughs> a parking yeah. lot. It's Michael parking lot. Okay. No. All right. Michael Parks and Recreation. Ooh, that's a good one. All right, so you ready for mine? My, uh, the little, you know, we called it the Goratorium, and I, my little segments have not really, there's not a lot gory about them. It's just a word that we needed to take <laughs> advantage of. And this is no different. Well, it's slightly different. I, I just, well, what I'm trying to say is I was completely unprepared until about maybe 20 minutes before I called you. Oh, wow. I had no idea what I was going to do. Way to tell our audience that you, <laughs> your preparation well, for the show look, means I've nothing. I've been busy. I, I didn't have a lot of time to prepare. So luckily, I saw a, um saw an article in Forbes titled, What is the scariest movie ever? Science now has an answer to that question. Oh, science. The science, science community science. is breaking down <laughs> my taste in movies. Well, I mean, yeah, it does seem a little, I mean, it's interesting. Okay, let me just read what they, uh, what the thing is here. Wait, um, was that, was that, what magazine was it written for? I'm sorry. Forbes. Oh, it was Forbes. Yes. Which, okay. That doesn't sound like a sciencey magazine. No, it's not. It's usually about like, uh, you know. Uh, business shit like that. Yes, sure. Like you ever picked up a Forbes magazine? I I read Forbes articles. <laughs> Obviously, that's how you came up with this. Uh, but only the interesting ones. Okay. Anyway, you you decide if this is a dumb idea or not. I think it's kind of cool and it kind of caught my eye. And there's a list that we can go through, so everybody will will get to kind of look at stuff that we like. Anyway. Okay. Broadband choices. This is a, what do they call it? A comparison tool for broadband deals. That is literally the only definition that they give of this uh, company. It's called Broadband Choices. Well, they came up with the idea to find out what the scariest movies are based on um, heart rate data that they collected. So they got um, 50 people, variety of ages. Okay. And they watched over 100 hours of scary movies. And during that, they tracked- In one sitting? Uh, 
I don't know. Like, did like, they have wow. their eyes pried open like Alex and Clockwork Orange? I don't know. So out of all of that data, they came up with a list, um, a scientifically, uh, you know, put Science. together, put to, yes, put together a list of what they believe to be the scariest 35 movies ever made. Weird science. Yeah. <laughs> Oingo Boingo. I'm reading your article here. So what do they say is the number one movie? Do they just come out and say it? They do say that, um, you know, the, the movies in the top five are all um, modern movies, you know, because mm-hmm. to me, I mean, I have what I think are my, you know, scariest movies. And um, did they make their list? They do, but way farther down than you would think. Okay. Like all of the ones in their top 10 are from the last probably 15 years, I would think. I don't know when the last one looks mm-hmm. like. But this is just based on heart rate. Based and on heart rate. Sweatiness. I, yeah, what? sweaty palms. They measured their palm sweat. They, um, their brows. <laughs> they had a monitor on their brows. <laughs> <laughs> they got a brow monitor. I don't know what that means. Was there was there a pucker sensor yeah, on their yeah. anus? Yeah, pucker on your yeah. anus. Yeah, they had a little sensor down there, and when it was squozing, a little alarm went off. <laughs> um, <laughs> a light goes on. <laughs> yeah, like a little LED. And they're given a treat, which I don't know why they had to do that, but <laughs> okay. I think they were doing more than just. Uh, you know, measuring heart rates, if you know what I mean. So, no, this is interesting. And how many people did you say it took part it said in it this? it was only 50 people. So it's not a huge pool that they were drawing from. But We need more data. But if they check them all with their beats per minute, oh, did they do blood pressure too? I don't think so. So they did it based on heart rate. What they're saying is their number one title was what? Um, was Sinister. Sinister. Which I can agree with. It was a good movie. I enjoyed it. I had a couple of little scares in that one. I talk about Sinister when he's watching those movies. Yeah. Those home movies would have been what Nicolas Cage was reacting to <laughs> yeah, in 8 millimeter. In 8 millimeter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or like uh, George C. Scott in Hardcore. Yes. Uh, yeah. So Sinister, I, I, that's pretty scary. The top three are James Wan movies. Yes. I mean, if you really think about it, like, I mean, Paranormal Activity is in there. That kind of, If I was watching that for the first time, I, that had a couple of scares in it. Hereditary mm-hmm. is number four. I didn't think of it as scary, though. No. I mean, it was unnerving. Yeah, there's more dread than anything else. I told you that I made Piper, my daughter Piper, cry <laughs> and leave the room during that movie. <laughs> Because when she, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen Hereditary, everybody's seen Hereditary. Yeah. When she sticks her head out that window. <laughs> <laughs> Knocks it out of the park. It it was jarring, but I remember laughing just, <laughs> yeah. just because it is, of it. There are funny elements to it, sure. It's like slapstick. One minute your head's there, the next one is <laughs> covered in ants. Her head was like when your ice cream falls out of your waffle cone. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So break down the, the top five. We've got Sinister, Two in, is Insidious, yeah, yeah. The Conjuring, Hereditary, Paranormal Activity. Yeah. And I, I agree on most of that, except I've, I've never seen Insidious. I didn't think it was that scary. Yeah. Or maybe I should go revisit it, but I didn't really get into the conjuring as well i enjoyed the conjuring and i i do like both of those movies conjuring and the conjuring 2 and conjuring 2 shows up in number seven yeah it follows have you seen it follows yeah i thought it was boring i was not scared by it in the least no it was so hyped up yeah i really thought it was um a venereal disease that's really what it is right right they all got vd yeah okay Move on. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Go get a shot or something. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I thought it was... I just didn't think it was uh, very scary. The Babadook? Uh, it, was, it was scary, I suppose. 
I, I suppose. I, I guess that kid just threw me off. You know, he's become a a meme generator from that kid screaming in the back seat and his oh. voice. I think that's what took me out of it. I yeah. couldn't stand that kid's voice. Yeah, you just wanted to slap it. I want to pit him against uh, Bob. Yeah. And <laughs> in what house by the cemetery? Yeah. Oh, Bob. Bob. Man, Bob. I just I just saw him the other day and I was like it was making me angry. Mhm. I wish you could stick his hat out, out of a car window oh. and hit it with, with a telephone pole. Yeah. I do. The Descent was pretty freaky. I I really like that movie. I like The Descent. I agree with it being up there. Now, it doesn't need to be up so high. When really, The Exorcist was probably the, one of the scariest movies of all time. Well, that's right? why I think this list is interesting, because all of the top ones are fairly new. Mm-hmm. It gradually goes older and older and older. Yeah, you're right. Um, Nightmare on Elm Street, Halloween, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, all of those are kind of grouped in the teens. The Shining's down there at 33. Which, I mean, yeah, it's more... But The Thing is number 25. Annabelle being a new movie at 27. Yeah, I don't think that was where... Did you see that one? Did you see Annabelle? Uh, yeah, yeah, I watched those. Get Out is number 34. Did you get scared and get out? Uh, no. I, I want to see their study group. Now. Yeah. I want to know what the is age little, range is. There's some problems in here. Yeah. Poltergeist is number 26. I mean, granted, these older movies, right? If they tested these people, they probably have already seen these movies. Maybe act- so. So they don't have such a reaction to uh, That makes sense. Right. Yeah. Right. You're probably right. They've seen it before. Your study group should be and people like, in a certain age range that has never seen any of these movies. Show an old lady in her 90s The Exorcist and her <laughs> heart rate's going to jump way up. <laughs> I mean, like, Texas Chainsaw Massacre? But yeah, I mean, I see what you're saying. Like, you know, if they watch these for the first time, it'd be yeah. different. Yeah. So anyway, interesting list. Yeah. I From mean, a lot of Forbes. the old favorites, but like auditions number 35 i i bet that would still get a jump in uh, uh heart activity from me all right it's a freaky one but you know it's interesting interesting i'd like to do it with a different um list of movies you know and see maybe some that are not quite horror movies that we you know they also have the biggest jump scares by heart rate right so Insidious had the best jump scares. Right. 133 beats per minute. That's a lot, isn't it? That's like you should consult your physician. The Exorcist 3 is on that list. Yes. And you notice that the little icon below it is a nurse. Uh, right. We all know which scene they're talking about. <laughs> it would about. have to be that scene. It would have to be. It was just perfectly timed. Yeah, it really was. The Descent being in there. Yeah, I wonder which scene they're talking about. I had trouble with The Descent. We've talked about this before, just because it, I think it did a really good job on capturing the claustrophobia. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, and we talked about this, too, uh, as above, so below. Mm-hmm. It was not very well reviewed, and I, I, I actually like that movie. What is Dark Skies? Is that the one where people are just like zapped into the air for some reason? And maybe. Okay, yeah, we did bring up this guy who did uh, who did as above, so below. He also directed Quarantine. Oh, okay. So kind of yeah, right, same. right, yeah. right. And Poughkeepsie tapes. Oh, really? So, yeah, we did talk about this guy. Okay. So. Which I still didn't get to watch the Poughkeepsie tapes. I saw it was actually on Pluto the other day. Yeah, you need to get but, your eyes on that. But I had other things on my plate that I wanted to watch for this uh, holiday season. We're calling Halloween a holiday, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. Okay. It is a holiday. So should we do the same thing for Christmas then? Should we go ahead and plan a marathon of horrific type of christmas movies huh that well, sounds great maybe one show where it's just pinned down as many christmas horror movies that would be awesome all right i love black christmas is that all you got 
<laughs> well, no, I I was thinking like I mean Silent Night, Deadly Night, and uh, about New Year's Evil. <laughs> yeah, Trading Places doesn't that happen? <laughs> <laughs> The real horror is fucking Dan Aykroyd eating that salmon through his <laughs> beard. You have mentioned that before. Ugh, gross. <laughs> That's so gross. It says here, though, modern horror movies perform much better than the classics, while movies like The Exorcist, Nightmare on Elm Street, and The Texas Chainsaw Massacre might be considered better horror movies, but they didn't scare the study participants nearly as much as the modern flicks did. Whoever was agreeing to be in this, you know, group, it's hard not to have seen, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But I bet mm-hmm. you if you, you know, got somebody that had seen it for the first time, maybe. We're just going to get a bunch of Amish people. Yes. And pack them into a theater. <laughs> or like those um, live in like South America that haven't seen like humans or, you know, haven't seen. Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> they just live in they're just a tribe of people. But that'd scare the shit out of them. <laughs> Throw a spear at it or something. So it's all, you know, relative. So very interesting. Very That was your uh, induction into the Goratorium. Uh, yeah. All right. Induction? Conjunction? Sure. Conjunction, junction? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That works. Sure. Everything works. And it's all fine. All right. So now, now that, that it's over, let's play the, uh, the theme song. Okay. There you go. Hit it. Thanks, Keegan, for that gnarly, gnarly guitar riff. Yeah. This is like we've never done this before. I know. we. I I do not have any idea what I'm supposed to do with the show. Yeah. <laughs> to me, too. I have no clue. You need to tell us what movie we're watching next week. Okay. You still have a deep dive on a, an actor, don't you? Um. You didn't, did you? I don't really. You did a goratorium and you totally clicked off your guy, didn't you? <laughs> I guess we could give you a pass. Okay, cool. Oh, <laughs> I swear I'll uh, I'll make it up next time. I'll do two uh, people next time. I'll do twins or something. Maybe those creepy girls from The Shining. I was actually going to do a deep dive and separate Tom Waits and Thomas G. Waits. Who's that? Thomas G. Waits was uh, um, Palmer and the Thing. Oh, okay. And Thomas Waits, or Tom Waits, the singer, uh, and yeah, yeah, it was uh, Renfield and Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula. Right, he's been in a bunch of movies. Yeah, he's been in a ton of things, but also an, a singer. Yes, a gravelly voiced singer that just sings about booze and bones and <laughs> cigarettes and that's what makes him perfect for uh, Jim Jarmusch movies. Tom Waits says he's a good friend with Keith Richards. Oh, well. Mm-hmm. He often shops at hardware stores to find items for percussion instruments. <laughs> Does that yeah. make sense? Some of his songs sound like a, just a, <laughs> a hammer and a, a trash bucket. can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Someone's just playing a Home Depot bucket with a hammer. So anyway, no, I I started to break those two down. I don't think there's a whole lot with it. I just thought it was since I was breaking down similar people and mm-hmm. such. Yeah. I will tear up that sticky note. Oh, you're actually tearing it up <laughs> right now. <laughs> yes. So anyway, let's go into what next week movie is. Yes. How about that? The reason you came here. Yes. I'm excited. I'm on tinter hooks right now. Ooh. Ooh. What are those? I just found out the other day that that's actually what you're saying when you say that phrase and still don't know what they are. <laughs> so <laughs> you know less now than you did before by talking to me. Yes. Thank you. I I totally appreciate that. All right. We came off of the hidden. Mm-hmm. 
which was a lot of fucking fun, man. Yeah, it really was. It really was. Uh, it kind of makes me want to go see the second one. Yeah, right. I forget that. But I'm still very apprehensive. Yeah. <laughs> it can't be as much fun as the first one. So anyway, the cast of uh, The Hidden, is there's a lot to choose from, mm-hmm. man. Okay, because I looked at Clarence Felder, 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 uh-huh. Felder, whatever, who was the uh, police chief, was it? Yes. Shit. He's the chief. He's sure. got a border collie. <laughs> was he the last guy to have the alien in him or? No, not the last guy. No, no. The last guy was the senator. Right, right, right. And the senator, he was, holy crap, Senator Holt is John McCann. I looked him up because uh, I went down everybody's path just to see where it mm-hmm. went. Because he had just a, a face that you've seen before. Yeah, for sure. But nobody could ever really pull out his name, I'm sure. He was in Police Story TV series. Yeah. Uh, Macmillan and Wife, Columbo, Barnaby Jones, basically heart to heart. Every cop show that you could possibly. Oh think yeah, of. he was probably typecast as a cop in many of these freaking things. Yeah, that would be great. You don't even really need to like change anything. Uh, Flamingo Road. <laughs> okay, that's just what. The lives and trials of the residents of Truro, Florida. Oh my gosh. Uh, it sounds horrible. I can't imagine why it was only on for two seasons. You had uh, Morgan Freeman. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Morgan Fairchild. <laughs> <laughs> what if. Okay. Never mind. Morgan won. Fairchild, Mark Harmon, Kevin McCarthy. Fielding Carlisle is Mark Harmon's name. That is the worst <laughs> name I have ever read. I love Kevin McCarthy. <laughs> that looks absolutely horrible. Kevin McCarthy was in both Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Mm-hmm. He was in, um, uh, what's the shrinking movie with uh, Inner Space? Oh, Inner Space. Twilight Zone, the movie. Uh, that, I think that was one of my favorites. All right. So this guy has been a king of TV. He was in Runaway Car. You kept bringing that shit up. <laughs> <laughs> Why did we talk about that for so long? I'm clicking no, off of it right now. We are not going back we're down not that. Re- <laughs> revisiting <laughs> Runaway Car. Oh my God. He's in Skin Deep. Yes. Yes, he is. <sighs> Jake and the Fat Man. Matlock. Saved by the Bell. Heart to Heart Returns. <laughs> oh my God. How many times are they going to return? So, anyway. Interesting guy. Yes. Not where I went. No. Like I, I looked at everybody. William Boyette, I really liked his filmography. William Boyette is the uh, beefy guy yeah. who was having a coronary while the alien was inside of him. Yeah. He was playing that character so... That was oh, a really like fascinating... I had to look him up to see if he died shortly after <laughs> making that He did that not movie. look well. <laughs> I think we mentioned that when he runs down the street, uh, you're legitimately worried that he is going to just like <laughs> his heart is going to explode. They had an IMSA crew just following just him. him. <laughs> like, yeah. Anyway, William Boyette, 217 credits. Oh. He was in Bloody Birthday. And I, I distinctly remember the box for this, 1981. Uh-huh. But I don't remember seeing this. So what? what is the one with the shish kebab on the front? Why can I not think of... That's happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to me. Yes. Was that a death that was in the movie? Did somebody get a kebab shoved down the throat? I don't remember. Hmm. Because that would be another thing that we need to put on our bingo cards is... Death by food. Death, <laughs> that's always good. But no, no, no. Uh, box art that depict... Scenes that were never even oh, close yeah, to being yeah, in the yeah. movie. Misleading yeah. box art. Mm-hmm. I hate that so much. Uh, Happy Birthday to Me was actually the same year, 1981. Hmm. And at the snobby Crawford Academy, Virginia's group of friends start to go missing 
years after horrible events that happened to her as a child around her birthday. That none of that makes sense. No. That is one sentence. Yeah. There is no punctuation in that. <laughs> huh. I guess whoever was writing that was like, this is the stupidest mm. premise for a movie ever. I'm not even going to put a comma in there. Hey, can I just say real quick that William Boyette, the guy from The Hidden, was also in Theodore Rex, the uh, dinosaur movie with <laughs> Whoopi Goldberg. I want to say that I've seen Happy Birthday to Me. This This looks really familiar. I think I for sure have rented it before. Now I want to see it now again. Now I got to get back to where you're at. So what 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 are we where are we at? I was reading Bloody Birthday. Okay, Bloody Birthday. Gotcha. Because William Boyette was in gotcha. that. Three children are born at the height of an eclipse of the sun. Ten years later, they begin to murder the people around them, even their families. Uh, which is basically the plot for Village of the Damned, isn't it? Yeah. When I watch movies like that, when you see kids that are just being evil, I'm like, slap them down. Yeah. You are way bigger than they yeah. are. You can put your palm on their forehead. You just push them the hell over. <laughs> and, and they can't reach you with that little knife that they're holding. Yeah. Little kids don't scare me. No. They gross me out. That does make me want to see the children. Though. Oh, yeah. The children's are great. Also... um, I don't forget if I brought this up before. I think it's an Italian movie called um, Who Can Kill a Child? Yes. It is way... I mean, the children's awesome. Um, oh, my God. I can't believe, like... I saw that on afternoon TV back in the day, and I just had my mind blown by that. Yeah, Who Can Kill a Child is way more, like, kind of gritty and realistic and has like a supernatural kind of element to it but it's also a little boring too i think it it's either french or italian it looks spanish spanish a couple of english tourists arrive on an island where all the children have gone crazy and are murdering the adults cool okay i need help with um bloody birthday here because now i'm finally on it and there's a girl in the images, mm -hmm. number 19. I thought it was Kim Darby. Hmm. She is so familiar and it is going to drive me insane hmm. until I figure out who that is. Oh, my God. I know who it is. <sighs> All right. Well, who is it, damn it? Uh, she is in. Let us in on the joke. She's in the master. She's oh, one God damn it. <laughs> master ninja. She's one of the um The podcast is over. Wait, I feel like I have a lot more to say about the master. <laughs> um just uh, she's uh Lee Van Cleef, um Timothy Van Patten. They've got a lead on LVC's daughter, which is the whole premise of the show. Okay. And it's kind of at this variety type of thing that we don't have anymore. It's like a variety club. Where there can be like dancing and singing and it's like not a strip club. Not at all to be confused with. That girl is the one of the owners. She's the daughter of the owner and she's disabled. She's in a wheelchair. Oh, are you done? Uh, <laughs> hang on. A, yeah, I'm done. I was going to say one more thing. No, I'm done. We'll continue the saga of the master yep. next week on. Can we just change the premise of the show? <laughs> hey, also, Julie Brown is in uh, Bloody Birthday, who I love. Okay. Remember Julie Brown? There's two Julie Browns. Downtown Julie Brown? No, that's the other one. Oh, she was the one in Earth <laughs> okay. Girls Are Easy. Well, she was in Any Which Way You Can. New Heart. Uh, also in The Incredible Shrinking Woman. Oh, yeah, like the remake. Did I ever tell you how often I sing Galaxy Glue, Galaxy Glue? What would you do without Galaxy Glue? I have no idea what that is. <laughs> no? That was one of the products that uh, uh, Charles Grodin. Oh. You know, that's why she starts shrinking, why Lily Tomlin starts shrinking, is because of all these products and chemicals that are around her. It just. <sighs> Made her shrink. Ah, uh, yeah. Wow. I could talk a lot more about this movie. Um, but we shouldn't. 
why spoil our listeners like that? It's an abundance <laughs> of riches. So downtown Julie Brown, she is not. She was in Police Academy too. Oh yeah. Okay. I don't know why I wanted to look at Bloody Birthday. I just never had a, never seen it before. It's got a crazy cast. Jose Ferrer is in it. Yes. A Susan Strasberg is in it. I don't know who she is right off the top of my head. I want to say she was in Mazes and Monsters. Now I'm getting stuck. Have you ever seen uh, The Prey, 1983? That girl, L- Lori Lethen. Who was in Bloody Birthday? She was in The Prey. Three couples go on a camping trip in the woods of Southern California during the summer, where a deformed man is stalking their camp. How deformed is he? I guess he's played by Steve Bond. Oh. Uh, pretty deformed. James Bond's cousin. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, sorry. I got lost. Let's get back to uh, the yarn here. Okay. I've, I've completely forgotten where we're at. Okay. Go back to the hidden. Okay. I'm talking about Chris Mulkey. Okay. He was the titular alien opening sequence. Yeah. He was the first guy that was had a bug in him. His opening in the movie was awesome. It was, it was great. It was a lot That's of fun. the best part of the movie, I think, is that first 15 minutes. But Chris Mulkey, 257 credits. Wow. And he's like... Young guy. I mean, he was born in 48, so add that up. He is 72. Okay. Well, maybe he's not so young. What? But he was young then, yeah. man. I mean, he was rocking it. He started out uh, in 1975. Dang. That just proves like you have probably seen him like over and over again. Oh yeah. And he's just that guy that kind of like the unsung heroes of all these old TV shows by just being a white guy standing. He was in time writer. Oh, cool. The adventures of last swan 48 hours. Hey, look dreamscape. Hmm, we've talked about that recently. Hmm. Hmm. There's a reason I brought it up, right? I would assume. Quiet Cool. What is that? I don't know, but uh, he was in Runaway. Quiet Cool was uh, James Remar. You'll see the box art. You'll be like, oh, yeah. uh, Yeah. Nobody ever watched that movie. Yeah. Oh, I know exactly what it is. Yeah. Yeah. No, never had a. (laughs) Although, is that an albino guy that's shooting at him down there? I don't know. (laughs) Uh, He was in Jack's Back. You remember that? Uh, yes. I James do. Spader. That's kind of like a Jack the Ripper type yes. story. I really liked that movie. I've seen it a million times back in the day. I haven't seen it in 20 years, so I couldn't begin to talk about it's it. It's got Robert Picardo in it. But uh, Chris Mulkey played Hank Jennings in Twin Peaks. Yes. I mean, everybody we've talked about the last freaking few weeks have been tied to Twin Peaks. Yeah. This is, might as well be called the Peak Podcast. Yeah. Without actually talking about Twin Peaks. Pink. Oh, yeah. Peaks. peaks. I can't <laughs> talk. Twin Pinks. <laughs> That's, uh... He's a real shit in Twin Peaks. He's kind of like a loser dude who's just stumbles into all this crime shit. But he has that face. Did that typecast him with that face that he could be just an asshole? It's not so much asshole. The the guy he plays in Twin Peaks is, he's perfectly cast in it. He is um, Peggy Lipton's boyfriend. Norma's boyfriend. Who has been in jail and probably was abusive. And now he's out and wants to get back with Peggy. Or Norma, uh, but she is going out with Big Ed, who is married. <laughs> it's complicated. So, yeah, he plays that part perfectly. He's like the guy that would, like, rummage through her purse looking for, like, money and stuff while she's in gotcha. the bathroom. But he was in 13 episodes. I don't remember what happened. So, he was, he's been in quite a bit, yeah. Um, That concludes our podcast Twin on Peaks. Twin Peaks. Didn't we say we were going to call it peeking it or something? Oh, or peeking yeah. Out? I'm peeking, man. I'm peeking, <laughs> comma, man. Uh, he was in Full Moon Rising. 
which we've talked yes, about so many I, damn times. We need to just watch no, the movie. I don't think that's the same thing we're talking oh, about. Oh, it's not the one with uh, Tommy no. Lee. No. Well, no, it's not. Clicking off of it then. I don't have time <laughs> don't, for it. Don't even go down If there. it's not the one with Tommy Lee Jones, I don't have time. <laughs> I'm just stating it right here. I am laying all my cards on the table. And now I'm picking them back up. I lost my I lost my connection. <laughs> you don't remember what you're doing, do you? You're rudder. Oh, no, I don't. Hold on a second. I, I can I can get this Will backwards. You just tell us that we're doing dreamscape and just get on with it. No, not doing dreamscape. But it's got the snake guy. That was Larry Cedar. Right. Yeah. The snake guy. The snake guy. guy. But now that you see his face, especially in that picture on his IMDb page, you can picture the snake. Yeah. When you see it. <laughs> yes, he's, <laughs> like, like, yeah, he's totally he a snake. He's wearing a hoodie. Now, wait a minute. Now it's Dark Moon Rising. Is that the one with That's Tommy what Lee it Jones? was. Holy shit. Yes, that's it. <laughs> wait a minute then. If he. <laughs> oh, okay. That's 2009. Boy, I was going to be really. That was going to drive me insane if he was. In two movies that sounded a lot alike, and neither one of them had Tommy Lee Jones in it. Oh, man, he was in Human Target. I kind of like that show. Mm, that was a TV show? Yeah. Just about a guy who was just... <laughs> yeah, had a big target on his back. Constantly in the line of fire. Yes. <laughs> yep, that's it. It really is. And it had a... Oh, uh, what's the kid from uh, Bad News Bears? He played Rorschach in uh, Watchmen. Oh, right, right. He was in Dreamscape. Wait a minute. That's another connection to Twin Peaks because uh, Michael, what's his name? It's a very Irish name. Uh, and he kind of looks like Getty Lee. David Kelly? The yes. The guy that says he's seen Enter the Dragon yeah. however many times. David Patrick Kelly? Yeah, David Patrick Kelly. God damn He's like it. A, that has the name of a leprechaun. But he was in <laughs> Twin Peaks. Right. So, anyway. I'm just It's all it's all connected. <laughs> I'm trying to work backwards. So well, talk about Twin Peaks a little bit more. Because I'm trying to work backwards from <laughs> to figure out where I was going. David Patrick Kelly was Sherilyn Finn's dad's brother. He's <laughs> what's What's her dad's name? <laughs> That's some point. Not to be confused in any way with anyone. No, 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 no. Twin Peaks. When are we going to start that Twin Peaks podcast? Uh -huh. Well, I might as well just make a connection through that right now. Such a good show. Because actually the the person I made the connection to or through is in Twin Peaks. Okay. Is it Ray Wise? No. So we are, we already know that Chris Mulkey was in Twin Peaks. Yep. As Hank. Grace Zabriskie. Uh -huh. Zabriskie? Zabriskie. Zabriskie? Who played Sarah Palmer. Yeah. She's Laura's mom. Oh, my God. She gives yes. some terrifying performances in Twin Peaks. She's completely unhinged. She plays that part so well. Yeah. But once you see her in that, it's it's hard to see her any other way. Yeah. Well, she has a, her eyes are very, you know, she has a unique face, <laughs> I guess I could say. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Well, she has 158 credits and she has been in a ton of shit. Oh, yeah. Goes way back to 1978, but she was actually, she was in... Norma Ray. Oh, okay. And she was in this movie that I wanted to get to. I really came close to picking it this week. My own private Idaho. No. Okay. <laughs> close. The Private Eyes. Oh, yeah. With Don Knotts and Tim Conway, because yes. I love that movie. I almost went there. God, she looks terrifying in that movie, and it's a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> Sheesh. But yes, do yourself a favor. You haven't not watched uh, the yeah. Private Eyes in ten yeah. years. Give it an eye. I remember it being hilarious when I was like ten. We'll probably be disappointed if we watch it now. Maybe. I mean, she's been around for a long time. Hill Street Blues, Santa Barbara. It's another TV show. Oh yeah, I uh, so thought about probably that. around that. Did 
I remember the box, but I don't remember anything about it. Some some rich California cat, uh, California, blah, 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 whatever. <laughs> Fuck. Did you? Got lost here. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a stroke. Uh, she was in Leonard Part Six. <laughs> there, let's bring oh. you back down. Uh, the Boost. Wasn't that a, that was a big drug movie. That was hard to watch. Oh, man. Do you know what that just reminded me of that I promised myself I wasn't going to bring up? Then why do you want to bring it up? Do you remember The Squeeze? Yes. With uh, Michael Keaton. Uh, Michael Keaton. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's all I wanted to say about it. I just wanted to know. It's easy for me to get the big easy and the squeeze mixed up for some reason, because they came out about the same time, or at least in my mind. Big easy is uh, John Goodman, right? No, Dennis Quaid. Dennis Quaid. That was Dennis Quaid and Ellen Barkin, which also had this woman, Grace Zabriskie, in it. So we're on the same okay. page. Ellen Barkin is a good name for your dog. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Really just grasping at straws. Anyway, she was in Wild at Heart, Child's Play 2, but she was in Servants of Twilight, and I think I remember her in this as well. It's a Dean Koontz movie, or a Dean Koontz book, and doesn't the guy, isn't he like a Satanist or something and kills himself at the very beginning? I'm not positive. Okay. I remember this box. I can't remember any part of the movie now. They made a bunch of those Dean Koontz movie, uh, books into movies, and I don't think a lot of them were very good. No. Again, with Watchers. Phantoms? <laughs> I didn't want to bring it up. <laughs> Fried Green Tomatoes. Oh, okay. Is that what we're doing? Th- no. And you've probably never seen it, right? I think I have. I think we've talked about it before, because if you just cut out half of the movie, it could stand alone and be just fine. Right. <laughs> So anyway, this chick, Grace Zabriskie, she's been in a ton of TV, ton of things. You can't miss her face. But she was in next week's movie, and you could probably guess it, from 1981, Galaxy of Terror. Oh, is that a uh, is that a Corman movie? I thought it was. Is it a Roger Corman Presents? I don't Maybe. know. Oh, my God. The greatest box art ever, ever, ever. I, I'm going to break it to you. Gently. I haven't seen this movie. I have seen it recently. There, Robert England. Okay. Yes. There are a bunch of these movies that were made around the same time, and I get them all okay. confused. But this is the one with Robert yes. England in it. Robert England. Sid Haig, Ray Walston. Oh, man. Aaron Moran. <laughs> Is it Moran? Moran. Yeah, Moran. But there's that guy I brought up a second ago, Edward Albert. Right. Not Eddie Albert. When I got to him, I quick clicked <laughs> off it real quick because I didn't want you to see that he was in Galaxy of Terror because it just pops up under gotcha. his name. Cool. And this is an alien science fiction horror flick, right? And do you you have seen this recently? There's another movie around the same period that I get mixed up. You know the guy the guy that was driving the car in Repo Man. Right. He he's the scientist in this one that okay. I'm talking about that I have I can't remember. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> sorry, that's a lot of non information. And uh, yes, you are correct. It is Roger Corman produced. We have a writer director. Well, one of the writers, Bruce D. Clark. Yeah. Who did absolutely nothing. He wrote and directed a a handful of movies here. Naked Angels, The Ski Bum, Galaxy of Terror, Hammer. Oh, that's a boxing movie with Fred Williamson. Shit, I'd watch that. Okay, so Forbidden World is the one that I'm thinking of. Yes. It has Fox Harris from Repo Man and... I get the I get these two movies mixed up a lot. I would get that too. I think is the box art kind of similar, like style. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, naked, you know, scantily clad woman being attacked by some weird monster. So let's read this off. Hey, science fiction suspense thriller in which a rescue spaceship crew meets up with horrors projected by their own imaginations. 
<laughs> I don't remember that part. It sounds like Event Horizon, really. Yeah, it really kind of does there. I dig it. I just watched the trailer earlier mm -hmm. and just totally this is perfect for us. Yes. This will keep our attention for many hours. <laughs> yes. And it it very much is, you know, the Roger Corman, like, formula for a movie. You know, it's every once in a while, you know, every probably 30 minutes you see some boobs and, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Oh, are we going to see Grace's boobs? Oh, I can't imagine. But she <laughs> is like, she is like the main character, or one of the main characters. Yeah. I don't think I realized that that was Joni when I was watching this the mm. last time. That's crazy. Where's Chachi? <laughs> Where is he? Oh my god, Ray Walston. This one might cost you a couple of bucks. I'm just trying to find out where we could watch it online. And uh, Amazon, every place from about two ninety nine. it looks like. Yeah, two ninety nine. I'd pay three bucks to watch this. I don't think I've ever seen this. It's one of those that maybe... The box art kind of steered me away from it. I don't know how. I mean, like. I would look at it to see boobs and monsters, but it looks animated on the box. So it's. Yeah, uh, kind of. It also looks like it's on somebody's van in the 70s. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It's got like that blood drip font. Cool. I love it. I know there's some real. Um, Again, I do get it a little confused with uh, Forbidden World, but they're both of them have some real kind of gloopy special effects and cool monsters. Mm -hmm. And it's got Freddy in it, so. Okay, it looks like you can watch the full movie of Galaxy of Terror on YouTube. Although this copy says it's an hour and 57 minutes long. It's the director's cut. <laughs> I guess, but I think it has... Uh, Spanish subtitles. Oh, okay. Well, what if you learned Spanish from just watching Galaxy of Terror over and over again? Uh, awesome. I love it. This ought to be a lot of fun. All right. Well, let's shut this bitch down. I think we've done enough damage today. Yeah, we've really... Uh, but it was a good, like, refresher course on how to do whatever we were doing before. <laughs> we have we have totally so, lost our way so easy to i mean i don't know what our problem was sober we were sober <laughs> you're gonna have to do some deep editing on this deep editing all right well let's shut it down let's okay. let everybody know that krista's got a new blog post that she is sending to me as we speak and i will have that up a spooky story actually for halloween i'll cut that part out because obviously it was past Halloween when this is going to come out. I should stop talking now. <laughs> All right. You said I, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, let's, we're going to regroup. <laughs> yeah, we are totally going to take our vitamins and we'll be back and see you yes. next week. Uh, check out everything moratorium. Check us out on social media and please like, share, subscribe, rinse, repeat. Whatever I say on Buy it. Buy a t-shirt. Buy a t-shirt. Buy a hoodie. Actually, I made it in a hoodie. Ooh. And it looks pretty good with a big pumpkin on the front. It says moratorium. Nice. Yeah, I dig it. It's getting cooler outside, guys. Come on. I make it where we make absolutely nothing off of this. So. Perfect. Just, <laughs> just what we agreed upon. No more, no less. This was a losing venture. <laughs> hey. We're in the red, but it's for you guys, so. Yes, right. <laughs> Don't know what we're eating tonight, but <laughs> it's all for you. All right. I right. shut it down. Until next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Yarn Wall, an M.T. Cornfield production. Hey, tune in next week for Roger Corman's Galaxy of Terror. Thanks again to Nate and Keegan for our musical interludes, and thank you for tuning in. 
Remember to like, share, and subscribe to all of our crap. If you have any movie suggestions, or just want to tell us how much we really suck, you can contact us at moviemortorium at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and long live VHS. Sorry, that's a lot of non-information.